Bioethics Law Euthanasia Consumerism Politics Terrorism Globalization Religion Migrant Population Interfaith Drug Addiction But I'm just going to be presenting some of the key findings that we have found uh, here in our research study in Singapore. Because if I'm going to, you know, be uh, presenting to you the whole thing uh, here in this report, it's going to be taking us uh, uh, like six hours. And I think I'm just given like four hours to present today. So I won't be able to do that today. So I'm just going to be presenting to you uh, some of the key highlights or some of the key findings that we've, uh, we've discovered when, uh, when doing this uh, uh, research study. What brings us together, um, aside from the invitation, of course, from uh, the ethos and then from the EFOS, what actually brought us here together? I think what brought us here together is our common burden to see the children and youth of Singapore have the opportunity to know who Jesus is and his love for them. So we have that common burden. All of us here have come because we have that common burden. We want to see the children and youth of Singapore come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Aside from the common burden, we also have a common commitment to see the children and youth of Singapore have the opportunity to be transformed by the power of God affecting their eternal destiny. So we have that common burden, we have that common commitment, and then third of all, we have their common belief that God's word is the truth. How many of you know that God's word is the truth? Yes. Amen? By which the children and youth of Singapore can know who Jesus is and be transformed. So we have the, those three things that have actually brought us here together. We have the common burden, we have the common commitment, and we have the common belief that we, as agents of change, can also bring that change to the children and youth of Singapore. In Isaiah 55, verse 11, it said, My word will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. You know, when, when, when we talk about the gospel, when we talk about the word of God, when we talk about the scripture, and when we pronounce it, you know, the Bible said it will not return to God void and empty, but it will accomplish what, it, what I desire and achieve the purpose for which it, shall, it, it was sent. So everything that we say, you know, as long as it's within the context of the biblical belief that we all have, you know, those are very useful to children and youth. So that, that said, the Word of God has a power to connect with young minds, convict their spirits, and cause them to come to a transforming faith in Jesus Christ. One hope together with, uh, with some of the partners that uh, Reverend Ezekiel Tan and Dr. Calvin already mentioned, we've worked together with them to be able to bring this study, not only you know, to Singapore, but all over the world. One hope we are a scripture engagement ministry, um, what it means is that in, in everything that we do, in everything that we produce, in everything that we develop, we want the children and youth to be engaged in the scripture. We have different formats, we have different ways of uh, engaging the children and youth with, with scripture. We have uh, short films in the form of short films, in the form of reports or studies, in the form of books printed, in the form of uh, website, in the form of applications. Uh, and we are very serious in our commitment. We say God's word every child. What that means is we want to give every child an opportunity to receive God's word. Every child an opportunity to hear the gospel message. Every child to have an opportunity to be able to be engaged with the scripture. That is our somehow motto, our tagline, God's word every child. And we're very serious with that. But we, we won't be able to do that alone. One hope, you know, we're what, maybe 500 people all over the world, or 400. We won't be able to reach, you know, about three, 3 billion children all over the world without partnerships, without our partners, without Singapore partners, you know, without other countries' partners. We won't be able to do that. That's why we're very serious in making God's word, every child, a reality, not only in Singapore, but all over the world. One of the things that we've done Digitally, digitally is the Bible of for kids. I don't know if you've downloaded this already. How many of you know YouVersion? YouVersion is a, is a, is a company that developed uh, the Bible, uh, the Bible app. 
Uh, but then we partnered with them and we developed the Bible app for kids. And this has been downloaded uh, in different nations. It's available for download for free. And uh, it's, it's in English. It's in simplified Chinese. And it's going to be in traditional Chinese next year. We've translated that in Bahasa Indonesia. We've translated that in French, in Portuguese, uh, and in different languages. So that's only one of the ways that we try to reach the children and youth, not only of Singapore, but all over the world. Our mission, we want to affect destiny by providing God's eternal word to all the children and youth of the world. That's our vision and our mission. In Asia Pacific, one who began in 1998, and to date, We've been able to reach more than 110 million young people all over Asia Pacific. And that includes Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, the Philippines, Myanmar, uh, Laos, Thailand, Taiwan, Japan, Mongolia. Uh, you know, from, 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 from one point to another point, uh, all over Asia Pacific, we've been able to reach 110 million young kids. And all over the world, globally, we've been able to reach more than 1 billion children and youth uh, through, the, through the gospel, through scripture engagement. And we've done that in different forms, like I've mentioned earlier. Look at this statistics. Between 2015 and 2030, that's 15 years, there are going to be 1,799 children and youth that will pass through the age of 5 to 19 in Singapore alone. So that means in the next 15 years, you're going to be encountering 1.8 million children and youth here in Singapore. That, path that will pass through the age of, bit of 5 and 19 years old. That's why at One Hope we believe that research is a very important aspect in desiring to reach the young people for Christ. Now, why is it, why the next generation, why is it critical? You know, we all know that children and youth are a large and fast-growing demographic globally. You know, many of them live and grow up in, in places where there's very limited access to the gospel, there's very limited access to scripture, there's very limited even to churches you know, all over the world. And then, you know, we also know that the age window between 4 to 14 is the most fertile time for children, you know, to come to know Christ. And it's, it's statistically, it's said that 85% of those who have come to know Christ have done so between the age of 4 to 14. You know, I, I came to know Christ when I was, you know, 17 years old. I was not in that statistics. But 85% said you know, that they've done so, they accepted Christ during the age of 4 to 14. So we all know that children and youth are a very critical, you know, audience that we have. The 4 to 14 window is a very critical age group for us to be able to reach them. Now, why research? So we can gather and share actionable insights with the church and Christian organizations around the world. We want to equip them and make an even bigger impact for Christ because research you know, research has proven to be the key to one of effort because we are going to be identifying the heartfelt needs of children and youth through research. You know, we, at one point in time during our, you know, our, our daily living, we, we have done research. You know, like if you want to eat, you want to do research first. You want to, to know what kind of food you're going to be eating. What more with children and youth? How, how, how can we identify with them? How can we reach out to them if we do not do, if we do not, you know, make research uh, for, for children and youth? You know, is it effective? How do we know? Research results should be measurable. It should guide change and produce outcomes in reaching and engaging children and youth. Here in Singapore, we've done this type of uh, research study, it's called asset mapping. And are we connecting with the next generation? You know, that's the question that centers around the asset mapping project that we did. Finding the answer to this question is a top priority for all churches. Are we connecting to the next generation? You know, it's a very important question and that it sparked an international research project in more than 40 nations. This is not the only nation that we've done research. We've done this in more than 40 nations all over the world. Now, what is it? It's a research initiative gathering data about how churches and Christian organizations in more than 40 countries are reaching children and youth of their nation with the gospel message. In Asia, we have done similar research studies, the Asset Mapping Project in Thailand, 
in Mongolia, in China, in Vietnam, and in Indonesia. And together with Singapore, that formed the six nations here in Asia Pacific, Asia Pacific that we've done the asset mapping project for. Not only the asset mapping project, but we've done the attitudes and behaviors of youth uh, that actually centers around what, you know, what the youth and children are actually thinking, what do they feel about certain things, about certain aspects, and we call it the spiritual state of the world children. And we've done that in more than 44 nations globally. It's a different type of a research project but similar in one sense because it deals with youth and children. And of course, you know, we've done this uh, asset mapping project here in collaboration with EFOS, with Ethos, and the Bible Society of Singapore and One Hope. What is our goal? Our goal is to share actionable insights with the church and Christian organizations around the world. We want to equip them to make an even bigger impact for Christ. Just to give you an overview of what we've done, in Singapore, we surveyed 125 churches and Christian organizations documenting how each interact with the next generation. 110 out of the 372 Protestant churches listed in the National Council of Churches directory, you know, they participated in our survey. 110 of those. You know, and this sample includes a variety of denominations, congregation sizes, and population densities. So we, we did the survey not, you know, very systematically. We chose those 125 different churches and organizations so that the whole Singapore church community will be represented. Um, and then 15 large established Christian organizations were surveyed. Now, where did we do this? We did this in three different geographic sampling. One in Heartland or HDB housing, the other one in suburban, and then the other one is in city center. The churches surveyed are located in three geographic areas and were allocated relative to Christian population of that area. For the purpose of categorization, each responding church was grouped by attendance. If you can see there, um, small churches, medium churches, large churches, and Christian organizations. The small churches are categorized in attendance between 1 to, 200, to 250 attendees. The medium churches is categorized uh, with attendance of 251 to 500, and large church is uh, categorized as 501 plus attendees. And we've, we did the surveys. Uh, for small churches, we 40 churches participated. For medium churches, 23 participated. Large churches, 47 large churches participated. Now, large churches would uh, also include mega church, uh, which would have 2,000 or more attendees, and then 15 Christian organizations. And if you could see those, also in this report, children are categorized as ages 5 to 19, okay? So we have two different categories for children, one for children and one for youth. Children are categorized as the ages 5 to, uh, to 12. And then the youth is categorized as ages 13 to 19. Furthermore, we split the, the children and the youth in two different categories, as younger and older. So for, for children between uh, 5 to 13, 5 to 12, the younger children are between 5 to 9, older children between 10 to 12, okay? And then for the younger adults or younger, uh, younger youth, uh, 13 to 16 would be the younger, the older would be 17 to 19. Now, how is that important? Because, you know, we know that the children between 5 to 9 would have different mindset uh, from those who are ages 9 to 12 or 10 to 12. And then same for the youth, same for the young adults. That's why we categorize them and we split them further into two groups. What we learned, the five things, the five things that we have learned among the ministry activities we explored, Churches in Singapore place the strongest emphasis on those related to youth leadership development. Now you would know that, you know. A lot of churches here have placed high priorities and high emphasis on youth leadership development. And then also, children and youth ministry is growing. Far more of the churches and Christian organizations surveyed reported growth rather than decline in their ministries to children and youth. 
And that's a good thing. That's a positive thing, you know. When we ask churches in different nations, in other nations, they said their church, their youth and children ministry uh, endeavors or efforts are declining. But here in Singapore, you're saying, you know, you're reporting growth rather than decline. So that's a good thing for Singapore churches, you know. Another thing that we found out is that technology is becoming increasingly important in reaching children and youth in Singapore. That's important. You know, we all know that Singapore is a very high-tech country. You all have the modern gadgets here. You have the smartphones, you have the tablets, you have the whatever, you have the laptops, you know. And churches place a high value on using technology to communicate with youth. And you know that, you know, Facebook is very uh, popular, Twitter is very popular, Instagram is very popular, and churches in Singapore are using that medium, that technology, in reaching out to the youth and children of Singapore. You know, you know talk about using whatever is there. So as far as technology is concerned, Singapore churches are placing high priority on using technology. On average, churches in Singapore are each reaching 140, and this is very important, reaching 143 children and 81 youth per year with the gospel. Of these, 42 and 32 respect, respectively were reported that first time interactions between the child or youth and the church. So yearly, you are reaching 143 children and 81 youth. So total, that will be 200 and 24 children and youth that churches in Singapore are actually reaching per church, right? And then another thing that we've learned, rich and new rich to children increase geographically from suburban to heartland to city center the highest. That means, you know, churches in the city center are reaching more children and youth than in the suburban churches. Now you would know why is that, so. In contrast for youth, Rich and new rich increase from city center lowest to heartland, HDB to suburban locals highest. Now let me let me ask you a question. How many how many of you here are from the churches who participated in the survey? I don't know if you would know if you're see. Alright, so thank you for participating in our survey. So you're part of these statistics. So if you're in the if you're in the city center, that means you're reaching more children and youth, you know, than those who are in the suburban. And then when you're, you know, and, and when you're from the suburban locals, you are also highest in terms of reaching uh, youth, okay? Now look at this. Uh, this is just a comparative analysis of the small churches, medium churches, and large churches, you know. When it, in terms of ministry growth, here in the small church, it said that more than half of small churches reported no growth or no decline in their children's and youth ministry. See, in the previous two years, by the way, small churches saw the highest growth rate with children ages five to nine. See, small churches, they said, you know, over 50% of those that we have surveyed, they said, you know, we have no, our ministry reported no growth or no decline. We just remained the same in the last two years. You know, however, they are the medium churches, they said over one third of them, they said they've experienced ministry growth. That means more than 33% of those who are in the medium churches, uh, they said we're reporting growth in our ministry. You know, if you belong to the large church, you know, you're saying, you're saying that you have the largest ministry growth and smallest decline. Now that, you know, I, I'm not here to qualify that. Uh, I think you would know the answer for that because they, typically large churches would have more ministry programs. That's why they're able to reach out to more young people. That's why the increase is more than those who are in the small churches. Now, how do we connect with, uh, with young audience? Now, to explore how ministries are connecting with younger audience, we developed 25 ministry activities, okay? And then capture the data results for these activities. And then the findings were aggregated to analyze five main types of ministry programs. You see the five ministry types, evangelism, discipleship, 
scripture engagement, youth leadership, and then holistic ministry. Same for all uh, types of churches, small church activities, medium church activities, and then large church activities. We developed 25 different ministry activities to measure you know, how important and how frequent these types of churches are doing these types of ministry activities. And then we score them from 1 to 10. So you see here, uh, in small churches, they put more emphasis on youth leadership. They scored 7.0. Now as the church attendance grows, their youth leadership activities rates also increase. So from 7.0 to 7.3 to youth leadership uh, 8.1. See? And then if you could see here, holistic ministry uh, rated the lowest uh, from amongst these three uh, church sizes. From small, medium, large. You see here, holistic ministry 3.4, holistic ministry 3.2, and then 3.6. Um, now, I don't know why is that. Uh, you would uh, find out in the report. Then you can find, uh, you, can, you can draw the conclusion yourself. Uh, and then you can see discipleship here. And then evangelism here. Uh, scripture engagement, 6.5. Scripture engagement, 6.0. Scripture engagement, 6.6. .6. Now you see the shape. Uh, so as the ministry, uh, the, the, the church of the size grows, uh, also the, the shape of the of this blue one changes but again leaning towards the youth leadership which scored the highest we learned that the importance and frequency of youth leadership activities increased with church size I mentioned that and then holistic ministry scored lowest across all organizations you know and holistic ministry would you know would, would include feeding uh, feeding the, the, the kids, you know, feeding program, whatever, uh, hygiene, you know, those things. And they placed the uh, lowest across all organizations. And look at the top ministry activities that churches participated. You know, churches in Singapore are big on church camps and retreats. Now, whenever there are big events, churches participated. You know, and you know, and large evangelism here, it plays number 10, but here in church camps or retreats, youth group, personal mentoring, person to person evangelism, leadership development, mission trips, music ministry, Sunday school, Bible clubs, or Bible study. Now, we're not saying that this is the strength of the church. The findings only say that this is how frequent they are doing this. Okay, strength and frequency are not the same. You can be doing this like five times in a week, but it may not be the strength of the church. The, the survey only said that you're doing this this much. Okay, strength, church camps or retreats, youth group, personal mentoring were the most common programs targeted to young people. While the GAP says social media ministry and Sunday school represent the largest differences in participation rates for programs offered to children and youth. Let's look at evangelism. Let's do it one by one. So look at this. Uh, person to person, we've uh, ministry activities we considered to measure evangelism efforts like person to person, scripture distribution, and large events. What are the key findings here? That the churches place the greatest value on teaching children and youth to share their faith with others on person to person evangelism. See? So you're more on person to person. When you talk about evangelism, church members or church activities are basically centered around person-to-person -person evangelism or large events here. This is for children. So children are more inclined, children ministry are more inclined to doing large events than the youth. Yeah. Here, the youth only scored 3.6, while the children scored 5.6. So when you're, that only means that when you're doing ch children's ministry, you're more inclined to do large events. And then, uh, but as far as person to person, youth uh, ministry placed higher than those that in the children. Because, you know, you cannot, you can talk to children one on one, but you know, but you just get them to nod and then say no to a lot of the things that you're saying. But when you talk to youth on one on one, you're going to get, you know, more intelligible, intelligent answers and more, you know, more logical answers. So they're big on, 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 on person to person. Large evangelistic events for children were considered more important than those directed to youth. 
As far as discipleship, it said that for churches, teaching children and youth a habit of prayer and teaching them to make life decisions with the guidance of Scripture were the most valued discipleship activities. Again, the chart that you saw earlier, this one, uh, it's in the report. So you will see the differences in the different activities, ministry activities that they, that they did to be able to come up with this uh, result. And then Sunday school for children was considered significantly more important than Sunday school for youth. But the reverse was true for youth Bible clubs and studies. So, you know, uh, when you talk about Sunday school, you talk about children. And you're not talking about youth ministry at all. But uh, for youth ministry, you're talking about youth Bible clubs and studies. So that's, uh, you know, as far as uh, discipleship. When it, when it comes to scripture engagement, the importance and frequency of the surveyed scripture engagement activities were similar across organization types. You know, Bible studies and clubs were the exception as churches considered it more important for youth and Christian organizations considered it more important for children. Let's look at the youth leadership. You know, ministry activities considered to measure youth leadership efforts are leadership training. So these are the main activities that, uh, that were done to measure youth leadership efforts, leadership training and development, teaching youth to disciple others, serving in local churches, and providing opportunities for youth to take leadership roles. We also find out that a lot of churches, uh, and this is across all organizations, that more um, older youth between the ages of uh, 17 to 19 are placed more in the leadership position than those in the lower uh, age group. Holistic ministry, teaching social outreach was the highest ranked activity for each church size. Life skills training was the highest ranked activity for Christian organizations. Okay. About technology, we learned that churches of all sizes place a similar high value on using this technology to communicate with the youth. You know, when we asked the churches to consider the value of digital technology for ministry, the results indicated, you know, that the churches of all sizes place a similar high value on using technologies to communicate with the youth. What does this mean? Now, what does that mean? It means that today, ministries are more often reaching young people in relevant ways. You know, and that's a good thing. You're not very traditional. That means churches nowadays here in Singapore are reaching children and youth in a more relevant way using social media, using technology, using high-tech connections. In fact, it is a trend that requires attention. In Singapore, we found out that the household access to internet rose to 88%. Household internet access rose to 88%. And mobile phone penetration hit 148%. So even more than the 100%, that means more, you know, one person would have more gadgets. <laughs> See? See, that's why it reached to 148%. How many of you have two cell phones? Really? No one here has two cell phones? Come on. How many of you here has, has a cell phone and has a tablet and has a computer? See? Now give those away. Just uh, leave one. <laughs> We're, we're taking offering later, right? For the <laughs> gadgets and... Uh, <laughs> so see, 148%. See, that means more than... A person would have more than one gadget. So, and it means, you know, churches in Singapore are using the technology to reach out to the young people of your country. Now, what does it mean? This means opportunity. Opportunity for children and youth in Singapore because they both have highly accessible to technology such as internet access, email, texting, WhatsApp. We found this, this out, WhatsApp is very popular in Singapore, right? And so, do you, how many of you are still on French story? <laughs> is it not, I, I, I'm on French story, that's why I don't have friends. That must be the reason why. I'm still on French story and I don't, don't, I don't have friends. <laughs> See, you're using social media, WhatsApp. And another opportunity for churches and Christian organizations to utilize and innovate using technology to reach and connect with children and youth in relevant and effective way. Wow, that's, uh, that's very exciting. See, to understand how churches in Singapore can better reach their communities, we ask them to describe their greatest needs and obstacles in ministry to children and youth. The greatest needs, they said, 
you know, churches indicated that family involvement and stable leadership were the greatest needs for both children and youth. See? That means there's not much family involvement in the church. That's why they're saying, you are saying, we need more family involvement and stable leadership. I don't know what, you know, what stable leadership means. Could that, that could mean, you know, you know, a pastor would be there for like one year, two years, and then he leaves, and then another, another pastor would come, or, you know, I don't know. So that, th those are just some of the reasons. Greatest obstacle, the two biggest obstacles in ministry were the demand of school. And you know that for a fact, right? You know, demand for the school and the influence of secular values were the same for both youth and children. And then lowest rated needs, finances. Because Singapore is a rich country, you don't need finances anymore. All of your churches are rich. See? And the need for more materials or curriculum in their language as the two lowest needs for both children and youth. Uh, and then the smallest obstacle in ministry were overwhelming growth in numbers and difficulty accessing ministry locations. Okay, so that's not a problem for you. Look at this. Uh, ministries naturally look to other like-minded organizations for best practices, right? So churches would ask other churches, what do they do? What are your strengths? How do you do this? So ministry organizations are also the same way. You know, they look for like-minded organizations so that they can look for best practices. For this reason, we wanted to identify which ministries are most respected here in Singapore or influential in working with children and youth in Singapore. Look at this. So these are the, some of the ministry organizations that have been mentioned. And Terry, you, might, you should be glad by this because Scripture Union places the highest. Scripture Union was mentioned more times than any other organizations here in Singapore as most influential and effective. See? Frequency mentioned 60 times. They're saying... You know, Scripture Union is effective. Scripture Union is innovative. And then we, let's do this. Let's make this 61 because Terry is here. <laughs> and then Youth for Christ Singapore, as they said, it's effective and innovative. Campus Crusade for Christ. Why, why don't we do this? When I mention this name or the organization, if you're from that organization, raise your hand, okay? Scripture Union. Yay! Yay! All right. Youth for Christ Singapore. Woo! Yeah, your second campus crusade for Christ, CEF, Arise, Youth with a Mission, YWAM, Navigators, Victory Family Center, The Edge, and then Royal Rangers Singapore. So, for purposes of time, you know, uh, we won't have much time to discuss that. But what is it? You know, research informs. Now, we've, we've presented some of the key findings here. We know that research informs. We know that research is very important so that we'll be able to know what other ministries are doing, what the children and youth are thinking. And then research, research also motivates us to act, right? What's next? You know, we know that God's word is a power, powerful seed. How many of you know that? Right? And then it said that good seed plus good soil equals harvest. Right? Good seed, the word of God, good soil is the children and youth. You know, if we plant good seed in the hearts of children and youth, you know, that's a good harvest. And purposely planting seed is more productive than random scattering. How many of you believe that? You know, when you purposely plant seeds than random scattering, that's better. The potential of this age group calls us to a purposeful response. If we hear their hearts, we can answer their cries. That we all work together for one common purpose, one common goal. You know, bring the children and youth to Christ. If we all work together, you know, and then, you know, somebody would just wave the flag in front of us, and then off we go. Then we could reach 1.8 million, see, of children and youth in Singapore. 1.8, they're coming to you. They're coming to you. you. You can't do anything about that anymore. They're coming to you. What are you gonna do? Are you going to be that one organization that would do all everything by yourself? Or are you going to be partnering with one another? Probably we could do it, you know, in, in, in five years, in seven years. But as long as we work together, the work of God, the work of the Lord is going to be faster. You know? Work together. 1.8 million. And that's what research does for us. It gives us, it gives us the information so that it, it will, you know, it will prompt us to do something about that. Now, we will not hide these truths. Psalm 17, I will let you read that at home. Our common cause is to see Singapore's next generation transformed by the power of God and His Word, changing their eternal destiny. 
what brought us here together? In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, that none perish. Not one Singaporean perish. Everyone would come to know Christ. Amen. Thank you so much.